Released in October of 2004, Champions of Kamigawa is the 33rd expansion in Magic the Gathering history. With it comes a wholly new storyline inspired by one of the more popular legendary creatures from the set Legends, Tetsuo Umazawa, and, as could be suggested by the Umazawa name, takes place on the feudal Japan-themed plain of Kamigawa. The set also introduces new creature types and makes changes to how the game treats legendary cards. There's a lot of behind the scenes and insider talk to take in with this set, and we'll get to that in just a bit. First, let's run through a summary of the story, the full version of which can be found in the Scott Mago novel, Outlaw, Champions of Kamigawa. Minimum Champion! The story begins with the Kitsune, Lady Pearl Ear, delivering the daughter of Kanda, the land's daimyo. The birth is a healthy one. She goes to tell her lord the news. She finds him in the company of Takeno, his general, Hisoka, headmaster of the Minamo Academy, and Meluku, a Soratami ambassador. The group is huddled around a floating rock that looks like a dragon curled upon itself. Kondo tells the others the item is the way to secure the future. Twenty years later, the world of Kamigawa has changed quite a bit since that fateful day, ravaged by Kami attacks from the spirit world. Toshiro Umazawa, a disgraced samurai known as an Ochimusha, stumbles upon a group of Saratami in the process of making an underhanded deal with Maronawar and his gang of Nazumi. Once his presence becomes known to them, he manages to make his escape. The Saratami, however, track him to his home to slay him for what he has just witnessed. Again he makes his escape, but sees in some fallen bamboo as he flees the kanji for moon, iceberg, unstoppable, and disaster. Wanting answers for this sight, he ventures to the Sokenzan Mountains to seek counsel with Hidetsugu, an ogre shaman with whom he shares a Hyozen blood pact. Once he arrives, he finds the shaman is already in the company of the brothers Yamazaki, who are in the employment of the bandit warlord Godo, and Binbin, who represents the goblin tribes known as the Aki. While the two factions are typically at odds over territory, they are surprisingly working together and are asking Hidetsuku for his blessing on their military campaign. The ogre grants it, and after the two parties depart, he informs Toshiru that a water kami attacked him in search of the Ochimusha. He makes his apprentice, the Budokan monk Kobo, join their pact and sends them into the Jukai forest to find allies among the local Buduka. In the meantime, Itetsugu will gather a number of kami killers so that they may jointly move against the Soratami and the blue aligned kamis, which for one reason or another, are against them. Almost immediately after their departure from Hidetsugu, Toshiru and Kobo happen upon Ben Ben and the Yamazaki twins. After they left the ogre, they had stopped to summon their god, the Myojin of Infinite Rage, for his blessing. The ritual accidentally interrupted by the pair, the Myojin summons forth a trio of kami to attack them as penalty. Toshiru and Kobo manage to fight the spirits off and find their way out of the fray to continue their journey. Meanwhile, Princess Michiko, now a 20-year-old maiden of the kingdom, has come to the decision that she must do something to end the long-standing war with the kami. Her close friend, Shoryu, convinces her that a solution might be found in the libraries of the Minamo Academy. As they go to leave, they are confronted by the Kitsune Sharp Ear, brother of Pearl Ear, who attempts to stop them from departing. Choryu, gifted in water magic, traps him in a block of unmoving water. By the time the Kitsune manages to free himself, the pair, along with their friend Riko, have already left. Now in pursuit, Sharp Ear uses magical trickery to lead the trio to his Kitsune village, where he and his sister, who had raised Michiko after the death of her mother, reside. The village, however, does not wind up being the safe haven it should have been, thanks to an army of Aki converging upon it. The Kitsune perform a divination ritual and are shown a mass of snakes. This gets interpreted as instructions for Michigo and her group to venture deep into the Jukai forest to find the Orochi, a civilization of snake people who reside there. It's about this time that an army headed by Captain Nagao arrives from the capital in search of the missing princess. Citing the Aki threat, the troops agree to defend the Kitsune village, as doing so would also protect the princess. Unfortunately, things did not go very well. The Aki hordes attack and quickly overwhelm the village and the Anjanjo army. 
Sharp Ear manages to shoot one of the Yamazaki twins through the neck, but Nagao is killed in battle as the raiding forces prove too much to handle. The surviving villagers flee into the forest, with Sharp Ear and Pearl Ear deciding to take Michiko and her companions to the Orochi themselves. Shortly thereafter, Michiko's group crosses paths with Toshi and Kobo. An argument erupts, but it is short-lived as both groups are ambushed and drugged by the Orochi. Toshiru is the first to awaken, his Hyozan tattoo burning as a sign that one of his blood brothers has been slain. And shortly after his rousing, the Ochimusha finds his companion's body strung up in the trees, apparently drowned. He immediately suspects the water mage, Shioru, as a suspect, seeing as he was the only in the two parties who avoided capture by the Orochi. Speaking of the snake people, they, and their god, the Myojin of Life's Web, have plans to slay Michiko, believing that her death would bring about the end of the Kami War. Toshiru, playing the role of hero, kidnaps her, and they flee to an easily defendable cave. Back at the capital, Michiko's father, the Daimyo Konda, has a vision of her location. He sends out mounted soldiers after her. It seems it was the idea of the Manamo headmaster, Hisoka, for Choyu to lure Michiko to the academy, much against the wishes of his Soratami overlords. Meanwhile, at the Orochi village, the princess's friends, Choyu and Riko, make their escape. Following Toshiru's trail, the Orochi follow. Back in the cave, Toshiru and Michiko receive a visit from the Kami of the Crescent Moon. The ever-smiling spirit introduces himself as Mochi, before explaining that it was he who put the kanji in the bamboo that prompted the Ochimusha to visit Hidetsugu. This kami, apparently, finds joy in being helpful. Mochi then tells the events on the day of the princess's birth 20 years ago. Though from the perspective of the kami, he tells how her father, Konda, used the sympathetic magics of her birth to tear a hole in the barrier between their worlds and steal a precious item from the most powerful of kami. After Mochi's tale had finished, Toshiru commits his services to the princess. Elsewhere, an impossibly large kami partially materializes on the world and, in one bite, swallows whole the divisions of mounted warriors Kanda had previously dispatched. Despite Toshiru's distrust of Mochi, the smiling kami continues to assist him and Michiko. He summons forth the source of the Ochimusha's black magic, the Myojin of Night's Reach. Her appearance dispels Toshiru's distrust and, in exchange for becoming more powerful, becomes her acolyte. The Orochi, now having reached the cave, find themselves on the wrong side of a battle against a powered-up Toshiru. Using the princess's tears to strengthen his kanji magic, the Ochimusha makes short work of the snake people, using the power of the silenced kami to mute the chanting worshippers who are keeping the Myojin of life's web in the material world. The Orochi repelled, Toshiru now faced Michiko's friends, Chiyoryu and Riko. He announces to the pair that he is now her protector, before placing a kanji on the water mage's forehead, teleporting him directly to Hidetsugu so that the ogre can deal with him personally. Before Riku and Michiko can react, Toshiru fades from sight and enjoys a moment of silence to himself. But there will be no silence here, as there is so much more to tell about Champions of Kamigawa beyond just the story. The set, which utilizes a Tori gate as its symbol, made a number of changes to the Magic the Gathering card game. Most importantly, it changed how the game handled legendary cards. The non-legendary knights are done. With the set, Wizards of the Coast ditched the legend creature type, replacing it with the legendary subtype. How legendaries were handled also changed. Previously, only one legend type creature of the same name could be in play at the same time. If a player already controlled a specific legend, such as the Tempest card commander Griven El Vec, for example, and another Griven El Vec entered play, the newest one would immediately be put into the graveyard. Now, with Champions of Kamigawa, when a legendary comes into play, if any other legendary permanents of the same name exist on the battlefield regardless of that permanent's controller, they all get sent to the graveyard. 
In effect, each legendary permanent now serves two purposes, its original as printed, as well as the removal of all instances of that permanent already on the battlefield. So, now if you play Greven, and one of your opponents already has Greven in play, they both go bye-bye. Sayonara. Sayonara. This would remain Magic the Gathering's legend rule until the release of Magic 2014 in the summer of 2013. Champions also introduced the evergreen keyword Defender, retroactively applying it to all previously printed wall creatures. This was done not just to reduce the rulebook baggage around the wall creature type, but also to cleanly allow wall-like restrictions upon non-wall creatures. Finally, and this is more of an aesthetic change than anything else, Champions of Kamigawa resumed the practice of using colored mana symbols within a card's text box. Beginning with 8th edition and on through 5th dawn, mana symbols within a card's text box have been monochrome. Now that's not all that Champions of Kamigawa introduced to the game as the set also brought forth three new keywords, Magic's first subtype for instance and sorceries, and an entirely new type of card altogether. The first of these new keyword abilities is Bushido, which increases a creature's power and toughness when it combats another creature. The second is Soul Shift, which appears on spirit creatures and allows them to return another spirit from the graveyard to its owner's hand as a death trigger. Third is Splice, which allows a text of a spell onto a spell containing the new arcane instant and sorcery subtype with the Splice card staying in the caster's hand. And while Splice and Arcane worked rather well in a vacuum, things weren't so peachy once Champions of Kamigawa entered into the greater world of MTG. We ended up making Arcane, which was a, a subset of spells that you unique to this set. Because one of the problems with Splice onto Arcane is, talk about parasitic, like I can Splice onto this subset of, of spells. This subset of spells exists solely in this set. But in limited, it didn't matter. You're parasitic. Well, all the cards you're playing with are from the set. In constructed and casual formats, it did matter because like, oh, I want to play Splice. Well, I have to make a deck of nothing but this set. Champions of Kamigawa also introduced flip cards, which have a special card frame with the top and bottom halves of the card having text boxes and the artwork in the middle. As for which half of the card is the active half, it's all up to which text box is right side up. And once a certain requirement was met, the card would then be rotated 180 degrees, flipping it into a completely different card. Like with Arcane and Splice, flip cards would also ultimately prove problematic, causing Wizards of the Coast to change how they made flipping cards in the future. One of the things when we ended up going to double face cards in Innistrad was having two clear, distinctly different pictures I think proved, made it a lot easier to sort of get the differences between the things. Flip cards also were very limited in the amount of space you had to write the words, just because you had half a text box. Flip cards also had the problem that when you attacked them, well, which orientation were they, which one were they, like, it just became hard to remember which was which. As far as cycles are concerned, Champions of Kamigawa had a good number of them, 10 to be exact. Probably most noteworthy are the legendary spirit dragons, Yosai the Morning Star, Kija the Tide Star, Kokushu, the Evening Star, Ryusei, the Falling Star, and Jugan, the Rising Star. Each of these were 6-drop, 5-5 five, five flyers with abilities that fired off when they were put into the graveyard, and each were fairly powerful in their own rights. By the way, one of these dragons, Ryusei, was also the set's pre-release card, complete with alternate artwork. There is also a cycle of legendary lands that each tap for a color of mana, as well as providing a second ability such as, for example, Chinka the Blood Soak Keep tapping for red, while also having an activated ability that grants a legendary creature the first strike ability until end of turn. Each of the stories Myojin also get cards, one for each of Magic's colors, which are indestructible by default, but can lose that indestructibility in exchange for a powerful effect. Myojins of Knight's Reach, a 5-2 for 5 and 3 black, and can cause each opponent to discard their hands, is considered by many to be the best of the bunch. Then there's the Hondins, which are Magic the Gathering's first legendary enchantments. Each color got one, but they're actually all designed to be played together. But each one of those would do something, but it would count the number of shrines you had. So for example, if the white one gained you life and the red one did damage, well, if you had two shrines, right, the white one gained you two life, red one did two damage. And so um, 
They were legendary, so the fun thing about this was it made you want to play a five-color deck because you only have one out at a time, but they played with each other was the idea. They were fun. I, 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 did, I did like them. On the tournament scene, Champions of Kamigawa, and indeed the Kamigawa block as a whole, was not well received. This was due in part to the fact that all rare creatures were legendary, which made some games, especially mirror matches, less than enjoyable. The set also had the misfortune of being noticeably powered down compared to the extremely overpowered sets of the Mirrodin block that came right before it. Of course, that did not stop 2005 MTG World Champion Katsuhiro Mori from including a number of Champion of Kamigawa cards in his winning deck, which included the likes of Yosai the Morning Star, Kodama of the North Tree, Okina Temple to the Grandfathers, and Kodama's Reach. He defeated Frank Karzin of the Netherlands, taking home $35,000 in prize money for his efforts. Congratulations! Katsuhiro Mori has kept the World Championship here in Japan! Of course, the cards that Katsuhiro used in his deck aren't the only cards of note from the set. Want examples? I think they want some examples, Piers. First off, there's Time Stop, a card that literally ends the turn and for which new game rules had to be written to specify exactly how this would work. There's also Glimpse of Nature, eventually banned in Modern. It's a powerful card drawing engine that works in conjunction with cheap and zero cost creatures. The legendary creature, Azusa, Lost But Seeking, has over time become quite popular in EDH and is also a key inclusion in the powerful modern deck Amulet Titan. And Kiki Jiki, Mirror Breaker, another legendary creature, has become the cornerstone for many combo decks that look to use and abuse Enter the Battlefield effects. The Arcane Sorcery Lava Spike is a staple burn spell and is included in nearly every competitive deck list for the archetype. And another Arcane spell, Kodama's Reach, sees EDH play in nearly any deck that runs green. Gifts Ungiven, a card searching spell inspired by the Tempest card Intuition, proved to be so powerful that it's banned in everything except modern legacy and vintage. It also inspired a silver bordered holiday parody card, by the way. And then there's Sensei's Divining Top, a card that, when it was legal, saw widespread tournament play thanks to its deck stacking and card draw versatility. It was also a key piece in the combo that featured the Cold Snap card Counterbalance, providing a near lock thanks to the latter's top of deck spell countering ability, and was an important inclusion in the Legacy Miracles deck. Surprisingly, while the artifact is considered rather powerful, it was banned not due to power level, but due to the drastic slowing effect it tends to have on games. It was banned and extended in September of 2008, then in Modern in August 2011. Finally, in April of 2017, only six weeks before Grand Prix Las Vegas and its Legacy main event, the card was banned in Legacy, comedically making Grand Prix Las Vegas the format's first topless main event. I got it! So is Champions of Kamigawa one of your favorite Magic the Gathering sets? If so, let us know in the comments section here on YouTube. And please remember to give Magic Untapped a subscribe, and even toss a buck in our Patreon tip jar for more great Magic the Gathering content.